we begin with patriotism and protests across the NFL. The first Sunday of the football season coming on the 15th anniversary of 9-11. Not stopping some players from taking a knee, raising a fist during the national anthem. ABC's Kana Whitworth is in Santa Clara, where the 49ers and quarterback Owen Kaepernick will take the field tonight. That's where it started. Kana, good morning. Robin, good morning. Of course, the 49ers host the Rams here tonight, and we saw players across the league show their support for Colin Kaepernick's call to end racial inequality. But on such a solemn anniversary, we saw some teams unify in how they decided to handle this movement. Overnight, a wave of NFL members joining Colin Kaepernick's protest against racism and police brutality. Coast to coast, players supporting the movement. Entire teams making the unified decision to stand, but linking arms in solidarity during the national anthem. Oh, say can you see? On the Seattle sideline, it wasn't just players, but coaches, employees, even fans following suit. Hopefully it's going to unify our country to where there's a message that needs to be heard. And so you heard us, now listen to us. The Kansas City Chiefs doing the same, but their cornerback grabbing headlines after raising his fist in the air. Two Patriots players also raising a fist. An Ohio police officer is on administrative leave this morning after shooting and killing a teenager who allegedly pulled out a BB gun. Crowds gathered last night in Columbus to remember retiree King. The 13-year-old was killed on Wednesday. Michelle Miller is here with how attorneys for the victim's family are now responding. Michelle, good morning. Good morning. Police say Tyree King was one of three people stopped Wednesday evening after 911 calls revealed a man was threatened with a gun and robbed of $10. When officers recovered from the scene was a BB gun with a laser. Our officers carry a gun that looks practically identical to this weapon. Police say this photo shows a replica of the BB gun Tyree King was allegedly carrying on Wednesday when Columbus police officer Brian Mason shot and killed him. They're all right there running back through the alley. They're all. Oh, He's shooting them. Oh, my God. Now, it's in an 18th. So that shot's fired. Start a suspect Tyree's family attorneys say accounts from witnesses differ from the police and are calling for an independent investigation. We're told that he wasn't doing, doing anything wrong. He wasn't looking for trouble. According to the family, Tyree was a regular, typical 13-year-old. He was always laughing, always smiling. And instead of, you know, play, planning for a football game this weekend, the, the family's planning for a funeral. According to the Washington Post, since the beginning of 2015, there have been at least 60 deadly shootings by police of people holding toy guns. A 13-year-old is dead in the city of Columbus because of our obsession with guns and violence. Columbus City officials are urging for calm during the investigation into Tyree's death. In 2014, 12-year-old Tamir Rice was holding a pellet gun in a Cleveland park when he was shot and killed by a police officer. We don't have enough facts to know anything about how this relates to any other shooting, including Tamir Rice's. Um, that's why we do an investigation. Columbus police were not wearing body cameras and are not expected to until next year. Mason is a nine-year police veteran and was reportedly cleared of any wrongdoing after shooting and killing an armed suspect back in 2012. A grand jury will determine if any criminal charges should be filed following Wednesday's incident. Stunning story out of Pennsylvania where the Supreme Court there has just thrown out thousands and thousands of juvenile convictions issued by a judge who's been caught up in a corruption scandal. His name is Judge Mark Chivarella and he is now admitted to accepting millions of dollars in kickbacks in exchange for sending kids to private detention centers. The court says that none of these young offenders basically got a fair hearing. Some of them weren't even allowed to have lawyers during their hearings. So what happens to them and what happens to these cases? Marsha Levick is here. She's deputy director and chief counsel at the Juvenile Law Center. She represents the juveniles in these cases. What's been the reaction, Marsha? Well, the, uh, the reaction across the board is really stunning. 
I think that both the families, the kids, and the community is overwhelmed by what is really an unprecedented result in an unprecedented case. In terms of what happens then to these cases, I assume that we're talking about 6,500 cases, just so our viewers know, or, or thereabouts. I assume that a fair number of these kids were actually guilty in these cases. What happens to them? Do they get retried? The vast majority of these kids, first of all, won't get retried. I wouldn't assume that so many of these kids were guilty. More than half of these kids appeared without lawyers. These were hearings that took place in about a minute and a half. The judge made summary, arbitrary decisions about these kids, and they were denied the most fundamental rights of due process. So uh, these kids are really getting the opportunity to get their lives back on track and to erase what happened to them. You're right. I guess we can't make any assumptions in this case because, uh, as the court has said, there, there really was no uh, fair system and no justice. Um, I know that you're suing for damages. Who and what are you suing? Well, we're suing the judges and we're also suing the private provider who ran these facilities that gave the kickback, kickbacks to the judges. We are suing uh, the developer of these facilities, the Luzerne County itself, uh, for their conduct in this. So we are hoping to get compensation for these kids and families who, as I said, not only suffered violations of their due process rights, but many of these kids and families paid fines and restitution, really paid money back to the juvenile court as a result of being found delinquent. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping for a victory there as well. Uh, real quickly, uh, I understand, though, that the judge and another one involved in this case, though, they've asked for immunity. The judges have asked for immunity, and we think that this is, again, just an extraordinary situation where you have judges really acting outside the bounds of the Constitution, and we are hopeful that the federal court will not grant them immunity in these cases. Marshall Levitt, good of you to be here, Marshall. Thank you. being brought to light. A lot of Wells Fargo customers this morning asking, were they duped into paying for fees and services they never asked for? Credit card accounts opened without authorization. Late fees charged on accounts that customers never even knew they had. Those are just some of the findings in a massive investigation into Wells Fargo, infuriating for customers like Frank Ahn. At one time, I having looking at it, counting it, I had 15 accounts at once. It was just very frustrating. And these are accounts I never opened. Wells Fargo employees opening roughly 1.5 million bank accounts and more than a half a million credit cards that were never requested by customers. I'd have these accounts and I'd have like a $10 fee, a $15 fee, a $5 fee each month on each account. It adds up. A lawsuit against Wells Fargo by the city of Los Angeles alleging in some cases money was moved between accounts without customers' knowledge. Every consumer needs to trust their bank and no bank should take advantage of their customers. Wells Fargo ordered to pay $185 million in fines, and this week saying the bank has fired over 5,300 employees over the last five years for their involvement in the scam. In a statement, the bank saying, we regret and take responsibility for any instances where the customers may have received a product that they did not request. Some former employees say they were pressured to sell account add-ons to customers to meet what they say were unattainable sales goals. Wells Fargo now ordered to pay customers back in full. The unauthorized opening of accounts in your name, maybe using fraudulent email addresses or pins, uh, is just shocking conduct. A case shaking trust in the world's largest bank. The customer that you just heard from, Frank Ahn, says he is still waiting for reimbursement. For now, account holders are being directed to the Wells Fargo website for information. The Consumer Fraud Protection Agency also encouraging customers to file complaints with them if they think they may have been victimized.